Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. This series is designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate and trust administration. To keep up with all things digital, please subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Jennifer Siegel, a partner at Kleinbard LLC, Ross Brook, a principal at Estate Genie, and Justin Brown, a partner at Ballard Spar LLP, with today's topic. Welcome back to the Digital Planning Podcast. I'm your host, Jen, and I'm with my co-hosts, Ross and Justin. At the end of last year, we released an episode about NFTs and estate planning considerations. And today, we're going to continue that discussion, focusing on some of the most common scams and fraudulent activity used in connection with NFTs and what attorneys need to know to alert and guide their clients who have or are contemplating creating, investing, or buying NFTs. Many issues with NFTs can stem from poorly structured terms of service agreements, but that's just the beginning. Given the relative infancy of this technology and the current lack of regulation surrounding it, Some nefarious actors have emerged with scams impacting the sale, transfer, and ownership of NFTs. Recently, Ross wrote a great article for the ABA's Technology and Probate magazine titled NFT Scams Buyer Beware, which highlights a lot of the common scams and pitfalls. So before we get into Ross's article, let's get everybody up to speed on what an NFT is. Jen, can you tell our listeners... What exactly is an NFT? So an NFT stands for non-fungible token, which is essentially a digital token embedded with a smart contract. NFTs can be digital art, pictures, videos, a contract, a document, a tweet, a collector card for sports figures to garbage pail kids, and more recently are being used for concert tickets and for companies uh, using them for promotional materials. Non-fungible means that there is only one of a kind. And so the idea behind non-fungible tokens is that you're having something that's in a digital form that's one of a kind. So I'm going to ask the question that we frequently ask on the Digital Planning Podcast with regard to some of the new technologies that we're seeing. And that question is, why would somebody want an NFT? Justin, I still don't know the answer to that question. There are certain examples where an NFT can be useful, an in-game purchase, like Jen mentioned, uh, ticket sales where it's more of a smart contract than it is a collectible. But we get asked this question all the time of why would you want an NFT? And sometimes my best response is, well, why would you want that original piece of artwork hanging on your walls? Why does it matter that you have the original Picasso and not a a copy of the Picasso hanging on your walls? And and the answer often goes back to economics of scarcity and the value in a particular object. And those lines get blurred a little bit more with NFTs because they're in the digital format and digital assets are so easy to copy and look very, very similar, if not nearly identical to the original format. So that was a long-winded way of saying, I still don't get it uh, as, as much as I want to try. Jen, Justin, what are your thoughts around the NFT world? So I, I do want to stress that it's important to understand that the NFT is not, you know, in, in many cases, the actual art or collectible or digital asset. It, it is only a smart contract and it is pointing to the location of the digital asset uh, on the internet, which can be on a blockchain or or may not be on a blockchain, and can also be the smart contract itself can be programmed to collect royalties upon future sales. And so I think in the artistic community, having the ability for an artist to to create an NFT uh, that is based off of an original physical piece of art or a digital piece of art that they have created and to have control over future transfers and to receive royalties, you know, even in secondary sales can be uh, an attractive feature of the NFT and also um, providing different levels of income streams, you know, for the future. So it's a right to access the original piece of art or digital asset or or whatever it is. And I, and I guess there, I guess what you guys said is true. There is some exclusivity and value to being 
the only one who can access it or being one of a few people who can access specific pieces of digital assets. Exactly. And and to add on to that, you know, this is where the terms of terms of service agreements really come into play, that you may or may not be getting some copyright or other intellectual property right in the underlying art. Um, so that's where it's really important to look at terms of service agreements to see what exactly is, is being purchased. And if there are provisions that would invalidate or terminate or no longer allow for copyrights to be given if they're even ever granted uh, based on certain activities that could or could not happen with the use of the NFT. I think we're in agreement that the underlying smart contract feature of that is useful. It, it has numerous applications. But, but going back to the digital artwork, in the case of an NFT, I get asked, well, why would you want to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a digital image? You can't display it in your home the way you can, for example, a piece of actual physical artwork. And the answer is, well, there's other methods to display or to demonstrate that you own an NFT and to show it to others. Um, in September, we did an episode on the metaverse, and I think the metaverse could be applicable to this type of ownership. But again, the line to me gets blurred when we're talking about a digital representation of something. In the world of rewards programs and customer loyalty points, you know, I think NFTs could be and are beginning to be a little bit of a game changer there. Uh, recently in the news, Starbucks just announced that they are going to be onboarding a new standalone rewards program using NFTs and Web3 to really help uh, increase their customer usage of rewards programs and also expand the types of rewards offered. So it'll be exciting to see what what they do as this new rewards program expands and what other companies will do as a result. All right. So let me push on that a little bit. Can you convince me that a blockchain-based reward system is any better than just giving my phone number or using an app on my phone other than it's new and novel and unique? To me, that sounds exactly the same thing. We're just applying the blockchain to it. So I think specifically with Starbucks's program, they're also going to have some type of ability to trade or sell what they're calling journey stamps, which will be part of this NFT rewards program and then can be redeemed for, you know, real rewards. So I think the ability you know, in their current system, I don't believe you can sell the loyalty rewards points at Starbucks to other people. Um, so having this feature, I think, adds some additional benefits and, and opportunities for users of the system. The Starbucks reward black market. What a world we live in. So with my skepticism in mind, for for a year or two, we've heard a lot about NFTs and the possibilities. And I think those on the more skeptical side have also had their antenna up about, okay, what can go wrong? And that's where we're going to talk about a little bit today of examples of how individuals with greater knowledge than the people they are selling to are trying to take advantage of other people with less information, with less data and knowledge. And people are also, and this is my personal opinion, that they're trying to take advantage of some of this fear of missing out mentality that for a year we heard about how interesting and great NFTs are. And regardless of the outcome of, of that equation, there's still some lingering feeling of, hey, this, this could be the next big thing. And, and values only seem to go up. And for a period of time, they certainly did. From the, when they first gained momentum in popular culture and in uh, mainstream media, the value of NFTs, the stories that were being reported were of the increase and remarkable sums that some NFTs were being sold for. So, of course, some investors who see a world where prices only go up think it's a no-brainer to go invest in an NFT, regardless of whether you think it's a collectible item, regardless of whether you uh, find value in that particular object or, or, or digital asset, and just see it as this is easy money. So when that occurs, it's very easy for other people, for scammers, for grifters to come in and manipulate the system 
Uh, and so let's talk about a few of those examples. And then we're going to talk about how to advise clients to protect themselves, protect yourselves from um, I- examples of NFT scams. This isn't an exhaustive list, but let's go down and, and name a few. The first one I want to talk about is called a rug pull scam. And an example of a rug pull scam would be I want to create a new coin, a new NFT, let's call them Ross coins. And I am going to announce on the web that Ross coins are what you want to own. There's collectible shots of me and there's going to be a hundred released. And boy, do you want to invest in this? I need initial investors and I'll guarantee you for the first 50 of you, you're going to get a Ross coin at a discount price. And I collect your money and I say I'm building it. And then all of a sudden I shut down either the coin itself or the market. And that was always my intention that, that sometimes projects fail and that's, a t- that's not necessarily a scam. But when my intention was to pull your money, I was never actually building something out there, but I took your money and then shut it down. That's a rug pull scam. So how do you avoid this? How do we protect ourselves and how do we protect our clients from somebody pulling the rug out from under us. In the purest sense of a rug pull scam, what you're most worried about is somebody who has either a history of doing this or has no track record whatsoever of creating something new and asking for investors before you're able to get any meaningful value out of what you've just paid for. So the world, first of all, of NFTs is is very new. So it sounds a little ridiculous to say this, but Find somebody who has a history of building successful projects in the NFT world. Finding somebody who has a history and is a known individual or entity of creating successful marketplaces that you can trust. Again, if if NFTs only in the pop culture have only been around for a few years, no one's going to reach that level for me or for advising other people to to invest in that. But some might be more comfortable with seeing somebody who has even just a, a short track record of success here. Exactly. I think doing due diligence on who the seller of of the NFTs are, trying to find out as much about the project and whether there are other investors or other third parties that you can do further due diligence and investigation on to help determine whether the project is bona fide or if there are are risks that should be accounted for in determining whether or not to, to continue the purchase. Ross, what are pump and dump scams? So similar to rug pull scams, it involves somebody promoting an idea and then not following through on what they had said or or just completely manipulating the market intentionally. So pump and dump scams have existed in the stock market for decades, if not centuries. And there's no difference between that and what's going on in the digital world. It's just a new market. And again, going back to that idea that you have some people who have more information than others and are taking advantage of perceived greed or fear of missing out or misperceptions about the marketplace itself. So a pump and dump scam commonly might involve uh, an individual who's a well-known commodity, who is a well-known promoter of different crypto or NFTs or other digital assets and is able to influence other investors and tell them this particular asset, this particular investment is worthwhile making. It's it's going to go up in value. You can trust me. You should follow through and make an investment in this. And while those statements are being made, and while the value of that asset is increasing, at, at least in the eyes of the scammer, hopefully, they are selling out, they are removing, they are, they are exiting that position and only will let the general public or their followers know about their sale long after they have already exited. And when they do, or when other market conditions change that they know were going to change, they are long gone from that investment, leaving other investors to hold the bag, having bought in at a high valuation and now having a far, far, far less valuable asset in their hands. Now, pump and dump scams aren't particular to NFTs. You know, they can be used in a lot of other areas. The problem here is the SEC has a lot of regulations with respect to stocks and pump and dump scams that currently doesn't apply yet, you know, fully to the NFT market. That's absolutely right. And since the last time we talked about NFTs, the SEC has stepped in in certain ways 
uh, with regards to digital assets in general, I won't specifically say NFTs, but uh, they're trying to apply existing laws and previous laws to the current digital asset world. Where this summer we saw individuals charged with insider trading at one of the major exchanges. And that's an example of there's there's not new regulation that applies to crypto or to digital assets or to NFTs. But the the agencies who are looking into this are trying to use what they have available to them for the time being. I think that regulation is, one, a good thing overall for the market in the long run. And two, somewhere in our future, but whether that's next year or the next five years or the next 10 years, who knows? So in the meantime, they're doing what they can with what they have. What's another common type of NFT scam, Ross? So the next one I want to cover is called uh, a bidding scam. And this is pure manipulation of how payment is made and what is exchanged for a for an asset with regards to a contract, with regards to a sale. And a bidding scam is really as simple as, Jen, let's say that you create an auction for a certain NFT that you have created or that you just own and you have invested in and now you want to sell it. And I am the winning bidder. And I said I was going to pay 10 Bitcoin, whatever the price is of that 10 Bitcoin at completion. That's my that's my bid. And I'm the winner. And you've selected me. And then just before I actually make payment, I switch from Bitcoin to some other type of cryptocurrency. And if you're not vigilant, if you're not watching what's going on, and if the parameters of the exact sale are done loosely and you're just not being uh, a vigilant seller, maybe you didn't notice. Maybe you didn't notice that you got 10 Dogecoins instead of 10 Bitcoins. And there's just a tremendous difference in the value of those two coins. And I've walked away with the NFT that I've purchased and paid far, far less so that, that might be an extreme example because I think that most individuals who are selling at auction or um, and, and any other means, even if it's a, just a third-party contract, are going to hopefully be watching exactly what they're getting in exchange for what they're giving. But in a world where it, these happen fast and in a world where after I've received my NFT, if we're doing this with some level of anonymity, you won't be able to find me if you then realize by the way, you didn't pay the right amount. You you scammed me because you you paid with a different type of coin. It's the equivalent of buying something in a store and pretending like I gave you a $50 bill when I really only gave you a five. Well, hopefully in that situation, you're going to be able to find me in the parking lot before I drive away and stop me and say, this wasn't right. But in the digital world, much, much harder to do that. And I think one of the problems is there's no third party overseeing the transaction who can stop the transaction. There's nobody who's holding things in an escrow, for example, right? When the digital payment is exchanged, the NFT is exchanged instantaneously and you run the risk that the person runs out of the store and you can't get them. And isn't that the whole point? Isn't that what we've heard so many people who are in favor of this this digital market say, yes, but these are valuable because we don't need the middleman. The middleman is an extra cost. It's an extra layer of cost and delay. And we don't want that. We want a world where we can transact with one another and trust one another based on the the blockchain uh, technology that we're going to use for this contract. Well, until that's refined, until we have a system where I can sell you that NFT and the system knows only to release it once it receives 10 actual Bitcoin. And I'm sure that technology exists. And so hopefully in time, this type of bidding scam goes away. But it, until it does, it's evidence of why that middleman exists in the first place, because you cannot always trust the person on the other end of that transaction. And you sometimes need that unless you have the technology really verifying for itself that you are protected. So how do you avoid that? If you're engaging in this type of transaction with somebody, what steps can you take to avoid putting yourself in the position where somebody pays with a alternate currency? Well, what would you do if you were advising a client who's selling a piece of property? Let's go back to law school and call it White Acre. Selling White Acre from A to B, and you were advising B on the purchase of that or A on the sale of it. 
you would read that contract. You would go through with a fine tooth comb. You would make sure you would read the title. You would you would get the title report. You'd make sure everybody is abiding by the contract that they say it is. It is quite simply, and maybe this is just a an easy, too easy of an answer, but it's the due diligence on making sure what is agreed upon is actually what's happening. I think a difference, though, with Whiteacre is that you have potentially a title company or an attorney who can hold a deed or who can hold funds in escrow until both sides have fulfilled their promises and the transaction can go through, right? So you can do all of your due diligence in a real estate transaction, but you still have the protections of that independent third party who's monitoring everything to make sure it it works. I can do my due diligence on a cryptocurrency transaction or an NFT transaction, and I can look up the person who's doing it. And if I can even find information, if at all, on the person on the other side, but there's still an element of trust that has to go into it, that the person is going to pay with what they say they're going to pay with after you have given up your NFT. I think that's absolutely right. I think that It's just an element of be skeptical of every transaction. And I realize I'm starting to sound very, very negative on a lot of these transactions by saying, I I just don't get it. And really have to be careful because you can't trust anybody and you can't even sometimes trust the technology. But we're just not there yet. I I, I see where it's headed. But there's, there's incidents like this that get in the way of what is intended to be a middleman less contract situation. I think one way, you know, in this particular type of scam to help ensure that you're not a victim of it is to to check, check, recheck before any crypto is actually transferred. Because the way this works is they're changing the, the type of crypto right before the commencement of the transaction. And if somebody's watching closely, they're going to catch that. Uh, and it's it's when people are doing things too quickly or are having too much trust and aren't taking that extra time and extra step to make sure, you know, they're paying in the the correct cryptocurrency that was in, you know, the original agreement and that it's not switched at the last minute. Yeah, I, I'd absolutely agree with that. So moving on, I think one of the the other big issues with with scams and fraudulent activity is is just with plagiarism. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ross? Going back to where we started the conversation on, well, can't you just copy that digital image and you have the equivalent of, if if I have an NFT and an associated ownership of a digital image, the original piece, but I put it up on the web so that anybody can see it, so I can display it and say, look what I own. And then each of you download a copy of that. Well. That's that's not plagiarism, but that's still giving you the equivalent of what I bought and what I have, what I what I see value in. But plagiarism is a little bit different in that it's actually going out to the marketplace, taking your copy of what I've displayed, or maybe I haven't displayed it, but you found a way to to get a, a similar replica of it, or maybe you've created a replica of it. And going out on the marketplace and saying, this is an original, this is as valuable as what Ross has, go ahead and buy it. And the answer to this is sort of a combination of a few different scams that we've heard before. It's due diligence. It's luckily the the benefit of part of digital assets is that you can see the code. Now, I don't know how to read the code, but but perceivably somebody who can do the due diligence on the blockchain, who can see who created it, when it was created, the transactions that have occurred with regards to this token, and can verify if the story that you are buying into aligns with what you're seeing in the actual coding and the actual blockchain information. Now, that's a little bit different and and perhaps easier than, than fighting some forms of plagiarism in the real world. Because If you show up on my doorstep with what looks to be a Picasso, yes, there is a way to do an analysis of, does that seem to line up with what we know about what a real Picasso would look like? And can we make an educated guess? But not a lot of people are doing 
that type of due diligence on everything that they're buying. And so there's an opportunity for scammers to take advantage of the marketplace, the recurring theme here, and sell to people what looks to be an original thing, perhaps at a discount. And maybe you do a little bit less investigation when you think you're getting such a steal of an asset. And you walk away with something that is basically just a copy and the scammer walks away with 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 your funds. So speaking of inflating potentially the value of of NFTs, are there any strategies that scammers have used where they work together to try to artificially inflate the value of NFTs? What what a great pivot, Justin. So artificial inflation scams. Let's give an example of what that would look like. So let's say that Jen and I are in cahoots. You don't get to use that word that often. So we'll go in cahoots with one another. And we are going to scam the public and make some money off of whether it's a plagiarized NFT or something that we just created that perceivably has no real value. But I'm going to create a market and I'm going to sell it to Jen. She's going to pay some outrageous price. As proof to the world who doesn't know that we're working together, that somebody out there is willing to pay this price for this asset. Therefore, it must be worth that or something near that. And then she goes to Justin and she says, Justin, I got this great NFT. I need to sell it. I'll give it to you at a discount. I paid $8,000 for it. I'll sell it to you for seven. Or she goes the other way and says, I paid $8,000 for it a year ago and it's appreciated in value and I want you to pay 8100 And then Jen and I just split that 8100 We've created something out of thin air. Both benefited from it. Justin walks away thinking he has something of value when he tries to resell that on the market. Unless he's able to do the same thing that was done to him, he may find a lack of viable buyers and therefore his asset will be worth a lot less or possibly nothing on the open market. So that's how an artificial inflation scam works. Yes, and we will have successfully bamboozled him. Wow, this is quite some vocabulary in this episode. And then there's one more that I want to touch upon, which is an airdrop scam. And this one is really fascinating to me because, again, it's taking advantage of individuals' fear of missing out, of potential greed, of potential... Well, greed is probably a bad word, but but upside potential and and thinking about the long-term investment and that NFTs are going to increase in value. And it's as simple as the scammer placing something into your wallet. So we talked about wallets in previous episodes, but you're going to hold your NFTs, you're going to hold your tokens in an online, a hot wallet, or in some sort of US, or some sort of external drive, a cold wallet, regardless of how you hold it, I'm going to, as the scammer, place an item into your wallet. And I recently learned that you don't even need to accept that. If it, if, it, if a scammer knows the location, the address of your wallet, especially if it's, I, I, I believe, do believe in this case, it needs to be connected to the internet in some way. But if I know the address of your online hot wallet, I can place a token inside of it. You don't have to approve that. You don't have to uh, acknowledge receipt of it. I'm just going to put it there. Alternatively, and we'll talk about what happens. That's going to be a little nefarious after that. But alternatively, I can use this as a giveaway opportunity. I'm going to post it to my website. The first 100 people to email me are going to get a free Ross coin. And I'll send it to you. And you can put it wherever you want, whether it's your hot wallet or cold wallet. Now, when you do that... That item, that token living in your wallet might have a click here or it might have a, a link that you're, I'm going to ask you to um, acknowledge receipt. I'm going to ask you to um, do some additional step. When you do that, it's going to give me access to your wallet. And I'm going to be able to enter your wallet and remove any assets that, in, that are in there. Where it gets really nefarious is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a link that's obvious. We all know not to click on links of random emails that we get. Do we know that for NFTs that were given away for free? Maybe, maybe not. But even if you try to, I can embed that link. I can embed that my my secret way into your wallet. 
just within your by by anything you do to this token, including trying to delete it. When you say, you know what, I don't know what this is. I just want this out of here. I'm going to hit delete and I'm going to remove it. That action could be the key for me to getting into your wallet. So the first bit of advice here is do not accept free tokens. Maybe I give the caveat unless you absolutely trust the source, unless you know where they're coming from. But even then, I'd be a little bit leery. But secondly, regardless, if you get a free token and you you know about this, or two, one was just airdropped into your wallet and suddenly appears, don't touch it. Don't touch it for all of time. That is a permanent part of your wallet. Let that sit there because doing anything, manipulating anything to that may give access Maybe if that's the only thing in your wallet, then you can try to remove it. But I don't necessarily think I would trust the wallet after doing that ever again. So just let it sit there and and, and don't touch it. So, I mean, this sounds like a digital pickpocket, so to speak, or planning something in that can pick your pocket digitally. But other than not accepting it or not clicking on it or not trying to delete it or anything... Are there any things that you can do to protect your wallet itself? Can you compartmentalize your wallet or can you have a, I don't know, a, a, a staging wallet where before things go into your real wallet, they go into this staging area where you can kind of clean them or, or see what's, see what it is. Well, I think one of the solutions might be to have multiple wallets so that Just like you're going to have multiple LLCs to protect an individual investment in one of them. If there's a liability in one LLC, it doesn't impact the others. The same rules might apply to a wallet. Separating them, having multiple ones so that you're not jeopardizing other items in there is is a potential solution. So from a planning perspective, that makes me nervous because now we've got more wallets that are out there. Now we have more private keys that we need to locate and keep track of. So I, I prefer more consolidation and less less keeping everything all over the place. If you have one of these unknown tokens in your wallet, can you remove everything else from your wallet? Or is it possible that the removal of everything else could be a trigger based upon this token. Yeah, I think you're safe to move assets out of the wallet that you trust and relocate them to a new wallet and and thus leaving behind the assets that you find questionable or, or potentially corrupted and therefore plan around it using that. Maybe that's a way to consolidate over time your wallet. I hear you on the planning aspect of it. This is all about balance as we're trying to figure this out of how to protect versus how to how to have access to things, how to keep track of assets. I, I don't have a great answer for you yet. So I had a friend be a victim of one of these airdrop scams and 20,000 uh, worth of Ethereum was pulled from her hot wallet as a result of the scam. And, you know, she's been talking with the FBI and, you know, other investigative authorities, you know, right now to no avail. But the way that that scam worked on her hot wallet was there was some tracking device within the the link and, and the drop of the cryptocurrency into her wallet. So the perpetrator once it was clicked on, had full access to see everything that was in her wallet, every action that she took. So I think as, as scammers get more advanced with these types of technologies, it could be even more dangerous that they could get access to other assets that um, are within the wallet before they can be removed. Uh, so it can be pretty tricky um, to get to them, to get the assets out before a scammer could potentially get them, you know, as as this evolves and they're able to really kind of overtake somebody's wallet and, and directly control it. So it's scary. If you recall, when we spoke with Joel Revel from Two Oceans Trust, he described the protocol that Anchorage Custodian uses to store digital assets and access them. And when you talked about that, there was an arm that came down and accessed an individual wallet and removed it from the internet. 
and 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 removed its access to the internet maybe we have to have Joel back on to ask why but my suspicion is that something worth related to this type of nefarious activity that access to the online world could corrupt certain files within a wallet and thus give access to the entire wallet. And when it's offline, maybe you have that element of protection. Absolutely. I think that solutions to this are there. Maybe they're expensive and not commonplace, but in the future, maybe we'll see a protocol of that nature become more common. But it again, that, that Justin, to your point of all the steps that we can possibly take to make this safer also come at a cost of making them more cumbersome to initiate or to find or to administer or or to do everything that we're thinking about as planning attorneys trying to make things simpler for individuals. So I think that is a fundamental problem that fiduciaries run into and are going to be running into when they are serving as executors or trustees or multiple trustees of multiple trusts that are holding these digital assets. And if one of those wallets gets, I'm going to say, infected, so to speak, can that potentially impact all the other wallets that a corporate fiduciary or an individual fiduciary is holding in other trusts or estates? I mean, the liability there, you can see how that can just get out of control and kind of explains why a lot of these maybe corporate fiduciaries don't want to get into holding cryptocurrencies or NFTs as part of their fiduciary duty. And they're outsourcing it to sub-custodians so that they don't have that liability. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and as we close out, I, I, want to, I want to circle back to two very brief ideas that we've covered um, so far in this show. Number one is going back to just that level of due diligence. I think that's so important. When we've talked before about when using electronic documents of electronic wills, you lose some of that ceremony in signing the document because it becomes so easy to just click my signature on a document and and you lose some of the perspective that what you're signing is really, really important. Well, the same rules might apply to the digital world when buying or selling NFTs or other digital assets that it has become so easy to do and so commonplace. And that action of of just clicking through and saying, yes, I buy or yes, I sell resembles so many other activities that we do on a day-to-day basis on the internet. And and that's why it's important to just slow down, slow your clients down, do that due diligence, take the extra time. If it's really that valuable and important of investment, Spending extra time with it is necessary, but also just wise in general. The other item I want to leave with is we we briefly talked about the SEC and regulations. And we've used the phrase before, and some of our guests have used the phrase before, the Wild West, when it comes to digital assets and planning. And what I, I'm a little bit optimistic, despite this, this episode being all about things that can go wrong, I'm optimistic about the future of digital assets because to overuse that analogy, it kind of feels like the sheriff is coming to town or at least on their way because different agencies are interested in protecting the general public. There's just so much to do. There's so much to absorb and and learn about. And even though a lot of these scams we talked about today have had their place in other marketplaces throughout time, uh, the application of those same ideas of grift and scam now being applied to the digital world require a new set of tools and a new outlook on how to try to stop them. And uh, as this unfolds and as um, new things pop up and new ways to scam people pop up, those regulators are finding new ways to try to stop it. And it's an interesting battle that will continue to go on. Well, Ross, thank you so much for sharing all the information and the research that you've done in order to to write this article. For those of you who want to see the article, it's in the November, December 2022 edition of Probate and Property from the ABA, the American Bar Association. It's a great article. You should definitely check it out. For Jen and for Ross, I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast, and we'll see you next time. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast, the podcast designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate and trust administration. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.